Hi everyone, welcome to this recording of chapter 2 of Feeding Habits, which is called Wicked Child. I just wanted to come on here really quickly to give some trigger warnings. So trigger warnings for this chapter would include animal abuse, toxic slash abusive relationships, religious content, as well as death. So if you're sensitive to any of those things, I would tread with caution. I hope you guys enjoy this reading. I'll talk to you guys once it's all finished. Feeding Habits, Chapter 2, Wicked Child. The next morning, Eliza leaves two energy shots on the counter for breakfast, along with a slice of sourdough. Ginger icebergs the glass's surface, the buttered bread gone pallid and spongy. Next to it, she's left a note, as she usually does. Green casserole in the fridge, running low on OJ. Lonan retrieves the television remote from the nook between the knife block and flicks the TV to life as he drinks the first shot. Ginger root in this morning, a new addition, carrot stems, mush against his incisors, and he swallows just as the TV brightens to an image of some amphibian, a leafy-looking tree frog. The crank of their calls bulge like each red eye, the familiar husk of narration outlining the workings of mating. Lonan scoops up the second shot with his pinky and the saucer of sourdough with his index finger and thumb, and takes both to the couch. The sourdough disintegrates into a paste as it dampens with the second shot, its papery crust rough against his gums. He chews both but tastes little of it, is studying the uneasy translucence of the tree frog when the doorbell rings. He expects something mundane, a package delivery, an unaddressed sympathy card. Instead, a woman stands in the doorway, her hair damp and smelling like the coconut salve Eliza rubs onto her kneecaps. He recognizes her face in a fleeting, neighbor-like way, someone he might have held the door open for or let step off the elevator first. Breakfast? She points to the crumb stuck to the corner of his mouth. Lonan swallows the remainder of the sourdough quickly, combing off the crumb with a shallow smile. Sourdough. Did you make it yourself? It's probably from the back of our medicine cabinet. The woman laughs at this, though he's not fully meant for it to be a joke. Are you allergic to anything? I think I've got an extra jar of starter in my fridge. I can make a loaf while you're painting. Lonan's confusion is too overt, so much so that when he goes to fix it, to pretend he knows what she's talking about, it's too late. He sees the shift in her expression as she must have seen the shift in his, a quick quip of her eyebrow she also readjusts. I must have gotten the time wrong. I thought Eliza said 10.30, she says reaching for her pocket. I set my clocks wrong the other day, an hour too fast. It's funny, isn't it funny, how it throws you off? Lonan glances back at the clock on the oven, 10.32 a.m., then back at the woman who's now fiddling with a gold-plated wristwatch that glints against her bronze skin. No, you're right, he says, though his words are slow, uncertain. He recalls the note on the counter. Green casserole in the fridge, running low on O.J. Nothing about painting. My mistake. Eliza mentioned painting last night. You have a color picked out? She brightens. You mixed it for my husband at the hardware store. He said you suggested the green. I saw the swatch. I'd never have considered green for the kitchen. Lonan doesn't remember her husband, suggesting a green paint, mixing it, cashing it out. Working at the hardware store consists of feverish hours of absence with the off formation of blisters on his palms from the wooden stir sticks. Right, he says. The woman peers at their half bloody kitchen wall. You're doing red? Eliza's vegetarian. This is his automatic response, the only thing that explains Eliza's preference for painting the entire kitchen in near blood. At the woman's blank stare, Lonan turns to look at the wall, examining each plane of his throat as hot embarrassment makes him red like the paint. Her favorite color. We're trying something new. Avant-garde. All things he's heard Eliza say. That's unique. Very. So unique, she says, adding, It's so kind of you to offer some help while you're in the middle of painting your own kitchen. When Eliza told me about your offer, I danced in my living room. Is that weird? I danced because I'm going to have a green kitchen. A green one. Lonan steps farther into the apartment, toward the stack of paint rollers, one of many rolls of tape and the woman, her gold watch blinking in sunlight, her coconut hair coiling, herds in after him. It makes you feel alive, she continues. 
He forgets what she's referring to, doesn't know her name, only vague details, like the jeweled bangle she wears on one wrist, the shiny cast of hair gel stirruped around her curls, her teeth white like the canines of a wolf. But she doesn't seem to notice a starriness in her gaze as she says, The paint, the green, it's stunning, isn't it? The woman's name is Anya, and she lives three floors up. He finds this out at the same time he finds out Eliza offered to paint her kitchen on his behalf, though what Anya says sounds more like, When Eliza told me he'd paint the wall, I could have... What is that saying? I could have jumped over the moon. I would have. The entire thing. All its phases. Anya's got a toddler named Joey. He's turning two next month, a little boy with a curly halo for hair, two dimples that pock his cheeks. Joey eats apple slices dipped in almond butter and watches cartoons with both feet propped onto the couch cushion, too short to dangle down. Ever so often, he laughs, a shimmery sound like the inside of a snow globe. Lonin half-watches him as Anya's asked, He's good, don't stress. If he cries, he wants you to turn up the TV, because she's out of bread flour and insists on making Lonin two loaves of sourdough. So as Lonin tapes the baseboards, he simultaneously watches the boy who doesn't seem to have noticed him. The cartoon is mostly animated sound effects, neon colors that stain Joey's face. He watches the television with both eyes peeled, a focus Lonin mimics as he lays down more strips of tape. As he works, watching Joey from his periphery, mid-morning light glazing them both, he should feel more at Eliza's insidious attempt to keep him busy, distract him, but he only swallows, a glaze of contentment warming his throat on the way down. Glenn didn't call back last night, and Lonan isn't sure she ever will. By now, she's probably at White Bluff Motel, if she even made it, and he's taping baseboards too far away to know. So many places he could be if he had Eliza's keys, perhaps en route to Glenn's location, gliding along the highway toward a cream-colored motel that needs to have its roof replaced. He could be following the maze of its dark hallways to her room, listening for a rice maraca, the faint flute of lullabies from behind a heavy white door. But instead, he lays down tape, each tug of the roll making him flinch, even though he's the one pulling it. Anya gets back by the time he's on his last strip of tape between the cupboard and the refrigerator. She carries brown paper bags in each arm. You're fast, she says, and he looks up to greet her. Practice. Right, she says, circling around the kitchen island to put down the grocery bags. You've been the best thing that hardware store's seen in a while. Before you'd go in and no one would look at you, can you believe that? Not one person. I didn't think that was possible. Lonan swallows and nods, readjusting a line of tape so it lies completely straight. He feels her presence when she kneels to check his work, and then over his shoulder, her golden hand smoothing a section of blue tape. Lonan half turns, just enough to see the clip of her face, feel the weight of her arm on his shoulder. But Anya doesn't move. She smooths the tape, once, twice. Joey's good, isn't he? She asks, her fingers curving around the tape company's logo. Lonan inhales. Anya smells like Eliza sometimes does, vaguely floral like jasmine or cherry blossoms. Children are little blessings, powerful little blessings. Of course, he should say, there's no other way to describe a child. He's a blissful little thing, his only purpose to keep his feet in his two-inch socks, to stare wistfully at a television like it's telling his fortune in a language of pictures. Of course a child is a blessing, soft cheeks like the belly of bread dough, pinchable, kissable, thumbable, hands dipped into glittery temper paint and fingers that loop chicken scratches that will never be anything but art. Of course, he should say. He knows that, he should say. But Lonan's vision fuzzes. He sees little of the TV colors projected on the walls like a hypnotic, technicolor exorcism. He doesn't remember what it's like to be that small, what it's like to have his hands expand right in front of him like seedlings. He knows children are blessings. He's heard it in how prettily Glenn sings to the infant, how she coos when she cries, the cooing a sorrowful yet soothing thing. There is nothing to dispute what Anya has said, but as he watches the blurry swatches of Joey, an example of a blessed thing, Lonan is reminded of his own unblessing, of a child's room in the winter, 
How cold it gets when a grown-up child keeps the thermostat low on purpose just to watch him shiver. He wants to believe children are always powerful little blessings that stay good. He doesn't know why he doubts her. Joey is just this, a blessing on her couch, smiling at a screen because it's all he needs to do. But he knows better, knows the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable exist, where they all live and how they all start, as little blessings. He's met murderers, liars, sorcerers in the shape of his father, sisters, mothers, all the wicked things that emerge from their second deaths unscathed. He doesn't know what makes a child wicked. If he is one, if he's been one, how many wicked children he knows. Before noon, Lonin scrolled on the first coat of paint, Anya shifting a Dutch oven of sourdough into the oven, and Joey's on his second cup of apricot yogurt. Sun fizzles against the damp paint, cakes under Lonin's fingernails. Through Anya's bay windows, it floods everything, makes her apartment a golden little thing. Eliza hasn't returned any of Lonin's phone calls since he tried dialing somewhere between the first and last half of the wall. It's obvious Anya knows he wasn't aware of the plan, which is why every few minutes she states new reasons for her forgetfulness with the time. Eliza ran into me in the hallway and I'm so bad at hallways, she said, while rolling the dough between her knuckles. So many turns. Brushing her bench top with more flour. Time as a mother is such a commodity. It's like, what's the down payment for five minutes alone? But Joey's worth it. Joey's always worth it. He's just magnificent. Can't stay away from magnificence. You want some OJ? Lonan looks up from the paint blankly, focusing on Anya in an embarrassingly slow haze. What? Anya reaches over to the fridge and tugs on its stainless steel handle. It gives with a haunted sound a subtle sort of groaning and emerges with a glass bottle of orange juice. OJ! She shakes the bottle and the liquid froths. Oh, he says. Green casserole in the fridge, running low on OJ. We're low on that. Anya only smiles. She doesn't ask again, but instead fills a geometric glass halfway, pushes it across the granite. Lonin rises and presses a palm to his throat, the clock-like thump there. Where are you from again? She undoes her apron from the back with one hand. It falls, a lilac clump, onto the tile, and she leaves it there, only nudging it slightly with her toe. Her eyes are golden, too, everything in her apartment. Even the silver parts are somehow gold. Anya squints, and there the gold goes, focusing on him until she leans forward and plucks a strand of hair from his jaw. It sags with green paint, and before he blinks, she's clipped it with a pair of kitchen shears. You got some paint on you. Oregon, he says. Boston, New York. What? You asked where I'm from. Anya pockets his hair. He's sure it's a subconscious tick. She hasn't even realized, but still, he wonders what she'll do with it. If she'll send it somewhere to get scanned, bagged, tested. How much she can find out about someone with just a nib of hair. That's a lot of places, she says. You're basically transcontinental. From her pocket, Anya's hand twitches. He wonders what she's doing, if she's touching the hair or flaking off its paint or simply flattening out her pocket. Are you going to clone me? He gestures to her pocket. Anya doesn't look. I could. Why? You paint walls fast. You've got nice hair. Do you collect hair? Just from the people I like. Lonan sips the orange juice. It's tart and pulpy, claws down his throat like a hairball. Joey's now watching an animated show about animals, something vaguely instructional injecting tips for how to spell words like zebra and orangutan. Lonan doesn't react when Anya's cold fingers secure around the orange juice glass and tip toward her lips. She drinks the juice like it's something stronger, a fervency in each gulp. She finishes off the juice before he can take another step and then leans back with the glass so close to her eye, its polygonal surface distorts her iris. He's always been good at watching. 
This is what he does as Anya pulls a miniature bottle of a deep amber liquid from her fridge along with the orange juice, mixing them together so what she pushes toward him smells like ammonia. She drinks half, an easiness as she swallows and then slides the glass to him. He leaves it there for a while. He watches Joey, how he claps when more animals show up on screen and gets quiet during the wrangle of commercials. He's gold, just like his mother, with a gap tooth that matches the man's who grins in every photo hung neatly on the walls. A face he doesn't remember, not even in the hazy slots he reserves for memories made at the hardware store. No evidence of him anywhere else, the shoes on the front mat, only women's heels or child-sized sneakers. One hook that holds one set of keys, only the photographs. Where's your husband right now? he asks. One wine glass in the sink, one coffee mug, one saucer. Businessman, very busy. I don't remember him coming into the store. Anya takes another sip of the orange juice, even though it's Lonin's turn to drink. She looks at Joey, a desperate fondness that answers Lonin's question for him. She looks at him like she's searching for the face of the man in the pictures, searching because she hasn't seen it in years. Did he leave you? He asks. Anya reaches for the drink, but Lonan picks it up first. The glass has gone tepid from the heat of her palms, and the orange juice kicks as he swallows a gulp. Eliza asked me to paint your wall because she knows I want to leave her, he says. You're a distraction. Is that what this is? A distraction from him? I don't want to be distracted from him. Anya tugs at the juice bottle and Lonin lets her have it. She stares at Joey once more and then to the pictures she's hung around the apartment, darting between the man's face and her son's. A frown deepens on her face and she slashes it with another gulp of orange juice. He sees it then, that it's not leaving her husband did, but dying. I want Joey to have a good life, she says. I want Joey to have something to hang on to, someone to recreate. Anya's face is bloated and red, a soreness in her eyes like she needs to blink but can't. Lonan instinctually reaches for her hand. Her fingertips jolt him, but her palms are warm, the skin there taut like she's been clutching it for years. I thought the wall would help. Green means new life, doesn't it? I read that in a magazine. That it brings new life, I mean. New beginnings. New, new, new. Lonan glances at the wall and tries to find what she's talking about. The newness, the promise of something alive. But the apartment is only Anya's singularly used items. Picture frames, all perfectly spaced. Two kinds of shoes at the front mat. Anya pulls her hand back from Lonan's and holds it to her chest for a moment. She brings it to her mouth, gnaws on the knuckles, the skin keratinized on her fingertips, canines sinking into her fate line. How can I forget the dead when my son has his eyes? She parses a hand through her teeth and then looks up at him, like something startled her. I'm a good mother, aren't I? You don't think I'm a bad mother, do you? I should have thought about the paint fumes. I didn't think about them. Lonan reaches for her once more. This time, she meets him, pushing her fingers against his and squeezing until his fingertips go cold. He doesn't tell her to loosen her grip or untangle her fingers from his. He lets her stare at the green wall with a brilliant confusion, like she's searching for the life form in it too, like she knows it'll appear if she believes hard enough. The sink is halfway full when Eliza gets home. He knows the sounds her entrance makes, her heel-footed step clicking in stiletto, followed by the damp thud of her briefcase onto the welcome mat, the shuffle of her trench coat onto a hook where it sits restrained around the metal. The sink hisses as it drinks, its belly in unsteady, gaping mouth. This isn't the first time he's plugged the sink and filled it. This isn't the fifth, sixth, tenth, twentieth. He's done this so often, he knows what sound the stream should make when Eliza's shuffling gets louder, when he should turn it off completely. 
The stream pilfers the ceramic bowl, and he sees a light reflection of himself on the surface, like soup scum. Lonin, I brought takeout. Eliza's voice rickets through the hallway, even over the gurgling water. He pictures her fiddling around in the kitchen, peeling her heels off and leaving them in the middle of the living room, pinching a knob of butter from the decorative glass dish and sucking it into her mouth. Her routine is predictable, which is what's made it easy to memorize. Her careless lounging, removing each layer of her clothing down to a bralette and her toothpaste-colored pants. He sticks a finger into the water to test its temperature and it stings pleasantly. Finishing up in here, he says, which is a lie. He's only just begun. What? I'm finishing up in here. I can't hear you. Almost done in here. You're what? Lonan says nothing. When the water reaches the invisible line he's memorized where it won't displace onto the counter, he turns off the tap, pushes his face under the crane of the spout, and into the pool of water. His lungs never burn. Not so early on. He's always been good at holding his breath, but is getting even better. Can almost hit four minutes if he really practices. He stares through the cloud of water at his hair that flutters like the entrails of a jellyfish and doesn't stop looking. Lonan is an animal in training. This is what Eliza would say if she knew this was the way he buries himself. A stupid little animal playing tricks for a gold prize it doesn't even know it'll win. But he likes the way the water fills him, each gap, the way bubbles scramble against his scalp like fingers he's put there but can't stop. His father is a dead man, just like Anya's husband is a dead man. Lonan knows so many dead men. Some that matter more than others. Some names he revisits sometimes at the graveyard when Eliza thinks he's out to run an errand as innocent as replacing a bad container of cottage cheese. He knows of men who are dead but still living, like Harrison's father who no longer exists as a person but a corpse, hanging around in unnecessary things like a last name and eye color. Beyond men, he knows of many other dead things. Dead pets, dead street names, dead countries, dead houseplants, dead first ladies. He knows what a dead father does, what a dead heart does, that these things are meant to die. An inevitable thing, a sort of giving up of flesh, burying, toiling into new soil. He surfaces without gasping. He's learned how to resurface quietly, to readjust to breathing in a gentle way, and it's always worked. Noise would give his hobby away, another reason he sticks to the sink and not the bathtub. His eyes burn, each vein expanding red as he stares at himself in the mirror's reflection. Eliza could be so many places, still in the kitchen, testing a half-expired jar of pesto on her pinky, or she could be standing just outside the door with her ear skinned against the paint. Eliza's good at being multiple places at once. They tossed in two extra fortune cookies. Her voice is closer than before, wafts through the crack in the door like an essence. Two, can you believe that? I usually pay for everything twice in this city. Lonan rings off the ends of his hair and submerges his face once more. This time, the water clogs his nose first, leaves a cloying scar at the back of his throat, but he keeps his head under, a sort of baptismal thing. He saw pictures of his baptism once. Grainy flash photos overexposing a green-robed priest. He's an infant in these photos, just a small little thing like Joey. A reluctance on his face like he knows he'll be dipped under but won't remember. And it's true. Lonan remembers nothing from infancy, nothing about being fetal. But he's memorized the feeling of religion, how it washes him in the bowl of the sink like it did when he was a baby, a muted outreach for something bigger than him, something tangible. Bad luck and ill misfortune will infest your pathetic soul for eternity. Harsh but honest, I like that. Her voice only a burble in the distance. Maybe submersion is just another form of baptism. No one said they were any different. A holding under, a cleanse of wickedness. A rebirth into something you're supposed to believe in. Submersion does the same thing. The way it grips his lungs and holds them there. 
he believes it does the same thing. Joey will grow up without a father. This is a fact. This is what he can't change. Joey will never know who a father is supposed to be or who a father isn't supposed to be. Joey might smile like his father, pick up his toothy mannerisms from the photos Anya keeps around the house, but he'll never know his father. And he adds this state, too, a state of fatherlessness as a synonym for baptism, a rinsing of something hereditary for something else, something unknown, whatever that may be. You will soon witness a miracle. Maybe I'll go rent-free. A good Samaritan will pay for my groceries. Someone will marry me. I've been bad luck since I was born. Lonan is in love with Eliza. He always will be. There is nothing better than being in love with Eliza. There is nothing wrong with being in love with Eliza. There is no reason to not be in love with Eliza. Eliza is intelligent. Eliza is driven. Eliza is sensitive. Eliza tries to listen. Eliza knows how to take care of him. Eliza knows how to spell words like Zolpidem, wears lipstick in the shade very vermilion and is delighted when it rubs onto her teeth. Eliza is lucky. Eliza is hypnotic. Eliza is a holy woman, a sacred woman, a careful woman, a wicked woman. Lonan gulps water. Too much to keep himself controlled, he sputters, splatters the mirror. He hooks his fingers over his waterline, tugging until water falls out. He paces, chews his palms like Anya did, and studies himself slowly from the counter to the tile. He is a wicked child. Eliza is a wicked child. Everyone he knows. All wicked children. Accept what comes to you each day, Eliza says, which means she's opened three of the four cookies. That's truthful. That's raw. That's all you need to do. He lets his hair dry down damp before leaving the bathroom. Freshly shaven, cologne clinging to his throat like a warning, he knows she'll notice him before he even really notices her. Eliza sits cross-legged on the ground, a bowl of Peking duck and congee teetering on her knee. She stares at the television, tonight's documentary about butterfly fish and their various diets. Her shoulders peak bare as he's predicted, the sheer rustle of her black bralette taut across her chest. Cologne? Lonan adjusts the final button of his iron shirt. Eliza spoons congee into her mouth as a butterfly fish disappears behind a coral reef. That's your cologne I'm smelling, she says. You hardly wear it. Anya invited me for dinner. She looks at him. Her mascara is smudged under one eye, folding in the wings of her crow's feet. Anya. You didn't tell me about painting her wall. Lonan points to the crest of Peking Duck. Is that Satan? Tofu? He asks. Eliza sets her bowl onto the ground and pulls her arms over her chest. Her fingernails pill into the skin of her shoulder. Painting the wall was an activity that you didn't tell me about. I wanted you to see something new. You're always staying in. Some of her lipstick has rubbed onto her teeth, and he knows she'll enjoy it if he tells her, so he stares at the space between her eyes instead. You won't let me use your car. You don't need a car to do things, Lonan. She stirs her bowl of congee, the plastic spoon scraping against the styrofoam. You need hobbies like cross-stitch, pickling, painting neighbors' walls. I wish you'd told me first. Why, was Anya unpleasant to you? She has a child, doesn't she? Children can get fussy. Lonan moves toward her, and when he's close enough to see more than just her smudged lipstick, the pitchforks of her eyeliner, she rises and juts her arm from her hip. You're trying to distract me, he says. I'm socializing you, getting you acquainted. I've lived here for half a year. And you're acquainted with no one. Eliza wipes the corner of her mouth, a blot of lipstick going with a flick of congee. I was doing you a favor. Anya would be heartbroken to hear she inconvenienced you. Lonan takes a step back, but she's quicker than him. 
a strong pull of her arm around his so they're chest to chest. She smells like rubbing alcohol and oil from the takeout, a potency of her that stuns him. He flinches when she reaches for his hair and twirls his damp cowlick with her finger. Damp, she says. I took a shower. I didn't hear it running. Before you came home. That's strange. She drops his hair, smooths it behind his ear, and pats the nape of his neck. I swore I heard water in there. I'm running late, Lonan says. I don't want you to go. Her fingers tighten around his wrist, massaging each tendon there as if they're the strings of a viola. She's thanking me because I painted her wall, which you set me up to do. It's inappropriate. It's dinner. She didn't invite me. Why didn't she invite me? Lonan untangles her fingers from his forearm and pushes toward the counter where he's left a tin of madeleines, the only gift he could afford to give Eliza for Christmas, but that went unopened. Now on the television is a segment about rabbits, and in the palm of a white-coated man, a bunny sits, its nose twitching in sync with the jittering white lights. As the bunny twitches, sucking a carrot between its teeth, the man secures its fingers around its snout and presses against its eyes until the twitching stills. Those are my cookies, Eliza says. Lonan picks up the red tin and taps on its cover. Madeline's. They're mine. I'm giving them to Anya. When he shifts to move past her, she holds out a hand, untangles her eyelashes where mascara has clumped them. You're angry with me. I'm not. It's unnecessary. I'm not angry with you, Eliza. Your anger is unnecessary. Lonan secures his fingers around the tin of Madeline's and shifts once more, only for her to mimic his movement. They dance like this for a moment, his shuffle left matched by her shuffle left, his step up matched by her own. More of her mascara has smudged from where she unclumped her lashes, a lazy slash of color like a samurai belt. Even their stares match each other. As he bores through her with a nimble focus, like it'll move her somehow, she does the same. Why Anya? Lonan asks, letting her win the dance so he's backed into the corner between the door and umbrella stand. She wanted her wall painted. You chose her for a reason, he says. Eliza puts her thumb in the hollow dip of his eye socket and presses down until he wrings his head back and forth. Conspiracy theory. You knew her husband was dead. Conspiracy theory. Did you think seeing her would scare me? I thought you'd realize all you need is right here. Eliza shifts her palm so it rests on the crook of his nose, and like with the rabbit, presses between his tear ducts until she triples, kaleidoscopes into an army of copies. Her nail pinches, and it isn't long before he's seeing red, a gauzy film that makes her look devilish. She is a little hopeless, though. Lonan is used to being her tamed animal. He knows many things, but this for sure. He'll never be uncaged with Eliza. She likes animal testing but will never admit it, and he's her animal to test. As she reddens, he adds this to his list of synonyms for baptism. To tame. The next time he blinks, a carmine tear crystallizes over his cheek. Eliza daps it with her pinky, holding it up to the light as if testing the color, admiring it like it's jewelry. She sucks on her tongue. You pricked yourself, she says. That's a shame. The rabbit is enjoying a leaf off a lettuce head now. It's munching so guileless, so unseeing of what is actually happening to him. The television stings with these images until they embed into his eyes, a permanent seeing. She lets him go. As her body relaxes, his stiffens and doesn't loosen until she backs away. She doesn't speak further. She doesn't even look at him. The next door he knocks on is a confessional's, not Anya's. He's not even sure if this is what he's supposed to do, what protocol for confessing is. The glass pane of the left window is shuttered with a curtain, so when no one instructs him, 
He opens the birchwood door himself and rests against the kneeler slatted neatly into its corners. On the other side is a cotton-headed priest who says nothing through the honeycomb of lattice. He coughs glumly, slicks a hand over his brow. Lonan remembers vaguely from elementary school what to do during the Sacrament of Reconciliation, printed on a half-sheet of paper in a tiny font. Step one, two, three, and so on. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, he says, instinct and not memory. He looks at his hands, thinks about Anya, about Joey, probably sitting around her dining table with two loaves of sourdough, waiting for him. He hardly remembers how he got here, which direction the church is in relation to their apartment, if it's even walking distance, what time it is, if he can still make it back in time for dinner. The confessional smells rank like rotting paper and expired cologne, its corners seedy with overuse. Scratches mar the fabric he rests his elbows on, like someone clawed into it while reliving their sins, track marks on the floor from a rainy day. He can't imagine anyone else but him in this small box, caged in by the lattice, mumbling incoherent sins to the priest he hasn't even committed. Stealing a set of glass eyeballs from a garage sale, forgetting his wedding anniversary, missing Easter Sunday Mass to go whale-watching. He doesn't sign himself at the right times, or speak at the right times, or thank the priest at the right times. He lies when he's asked if he's lied since his last confession. He mentions nothing of drinking with Anya, of not saving the sheep or the bunnies even though he knew the outcome of their lives without finishing the program, of being a wicked child, of knowing wicked children, of not knowing the difference between wickedness and innocence and which one he learned first. He works at a law firm. He's married to a Harriet, a seamstress, or a stockbroker, or an antiques trader. He doesn't know. He likes golfing, parcheesi, drinking martinis on yachts. He's never overindulged. He's loyal to his woman. He wants three kids and a house with finished floors and no neighbors. He's a good father, a gentle father, a careful father, no wickedness, just an empty shell of goodness, like a father should be. His father is retired and visits him on weekends. They play checkers, paint birdhouses, keep a distance but toast with spirits he can't pronounce. Everything is good, it's all good, all good. That's not a sin, the priest should say, but they laugh. It's good to be good. Children are good, marriage is good, fathers are good. Everything an iteration of good. By the time his confession is over and he's well on his way out of the church, mumbling, I am heartily sorry, he believes his lies are true. He's absolved into someone new, Luca married to Harriet, three kids, an empty shell, dreamily stumbling through a house with finished floors that's actually just the sidewalk until a woman passing by with two small children has to help him sit on the curb. She asks if he needs something to drink, if he needs someone to call, and emerges with a half-empty bottle of sparkling water and a cell phone. She asks what's wrong with his eye, and he doesn't know what's wrong with anything, with eyes, with children, with sins, with confessions, with baptisms, with orange juice, with madelines, with wickedness, with practicing how long he can breathe under water because he knows it's possible, just like walking on it. One of the children, hair pulled into two plaits secured with pearlescent butterflies, pokes at her mother and asks if he's crazy. Her mother shushes her at the same time her older sister shows him a cool trick she's learned with a toy convertible. Its wheels were, Lonan gasps, the girl says, even crazy people think I'm gifted, and wheels the car again. People stop to watch. Church bells gong and elegy he's sure he's heard before. The woman's sparkling water dribbles from his mouth and dampens his dress shirt. Sun eclipses his face and eats at his throat like a parasite, like it knows all the unclean things about him, a watcher, an eyeball, a scorching little thing that bullets through his neck like the tooth of a wolf. The woman shushes her children and asks if he's got a health problem, a drug problem, any problem, and he could say yes to all three, but instead keeps repeating, I am heartily sorry, I am heartily sorry. And when she does call someone, no one he knows, he leans against the cool pavement, cranes his neck to the sky, and parts his lips so the sunlight fills his mouth. 
So that was me reading chapter two of this book. It was one of my favorite chapters when I wrote it, and I think it's one of my favorite chapters that I've written to this day. That last uh, religious scene, I don't know. I love that image of him just kind of gaping at the sun. I think it's kind of cool. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you so much for the kind response that I got on chapter one. A lot of you won't know this, but I had recorded that in June, and I was going to upload it since then, but I was too nervous. Uh, it's not, I love sharing my work. Like I, I share my work all the time. It's not sharing my writing that freaks me out. I am more freaked out about the prospect of people hearing my narration voice. I get embarrassed by it. Like it never used to be a problem for me, but like I can't listen to myself narrating things like my reading voice, like kind of embarrasses me. And so I was really nervous because I didn't want to like embarrass myself or like look like a fool. Um, But then I just took the plunge. I was like, Rachel, your audience is the kindest and they are so supportive. They would never be mean to you. And you guys were so much kinder than I could ever expect, even knowing that you are the kindest audience I could ask for. So thank you so much. Um, I love sharing this with you and I'm going to try to record as many of these chapters as possible that like are appropriate to share. So I'll try my best. It amazes me that so many people like chapter one and it wasn't even like the full chapter because there's a whole other scene after that. It's a pretty short scene, but still. So, you know, thank you so much for all the kind words. And um, I've had a lot of fun sharing the work on here with you in this way. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. I don't know how to pronounce that. How long are you going to cut that piece of wood, my sweet lord? Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, it's done. Oh my god, it worked. The lord.